Yeah. So I with water based two K polys, there is a time frame they, they say that you can top coat them, recoat them without having to sand between coats. Are you familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Do you do that? Um Oh, do I ever do that? Um Okay, so that would be like they call that wet on wet would be like the terminology I'm familiar with. Um We would be, we've been calling it a hot coat, but wet on wet works for me. Yeah. Um uh I've done that. Like if it if it if the first coat was um uh if it like there's no dust or anything in it and it, it just turned out really, really well, then yeah, if you're in that window, you're fine. Yeah. Um like it should um because I, I I think what's going on is you have your A and your B and they're interlocking. And once you get a certain point, it's cured to where um, you're not going to have chemical adhesion with the next coat that you put on. Yeah. Um, so there, there will be no burn in from the top coat. Um, so you have to hit it before that occurs completely. Um, so I've done that. Um, although a lot of times, um, if it's just me, it's like, well, you know, it might take me three hours to do the doors. That could be the end of the day. So it's like, well, I'll just come back in the morning and, like, yeah. you know, start over. But, yeah, um, um, I, you know, I've done it. I've done it a lot with uh, – I do it mostly with the solvent side of stuff. So, like, um, I helped a buddy, a guy named Corey – a guy named Corey is a carpenter and um, he had this big elm slab table, you know, like just a slab of elm and he's, it's going to be a desk and we are using uh, uh, a solvent product called velvet diamond. So it's, it's like a three sheen. Um, it, uh, it dries with like a velvet effect. It's like, it's like real smooth to the touch. And, um, it is nice. We did the wet on wet thing. So I showed up and we did a clear primer and uh, then we hit the, the open time, did one coat of the top coat and bam, you're done. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. That's most people probably know, this, but there, there's two kinds of, uh, there's two ways that paint adheres, right? There's uh, chemical and mechanical. You've talked about both of them casually. Oh, okay. So a mechanical bond is like Legos. Um, Legos stick to each other because they interlock. Like you have like the little nibs and like sticks into the bottom of the brick. There's, there's no fancy um, chemical reaction going on. Um, there's no, there's no, there's nothing that you would have had to remember from chemistry class like involved there it's uh it's interlocking because there's actually texture on the on the surface um then a chemical bond um we would mean you know there's actually paint chemistry that's going on where one part a is attracted to part b so to speak and uh the the wet on wet i think nick was given some other some other reasons for it but um, you can do the wet on wet as long as like you have a window. And once that window closes, the chemistry start side of adhesion is kind of out of the picture. And then you have to sand. So there's a mechanical bond for there to be intercoat adhesion. Cause you don't need Hopefully. both, but you need at least one. You need at least one. I mean, both is probably both optimal. Both is awesome. But, yeah. But <laughs> Um, you you can't have none. That yeah. would not be good. Yeah, none is when you see the uh, the oil uh, trim that's got been painted over with uh, a water based top coat with no prep. Yeah. that is yep. neither mechanical or chemical adhesion when you could peel the paint off. None is bad. <laughs> yeah, none is bad. That's that's an easy easy way to describe it. Um, yeah, that's awesome. So. Again, like talking to paint reps and like doing some homework allows you to understand what you're doing so that chemical adhesion can be something that you can play with and maybe not have to sand so much. Um, there's definitely advantage. That could be. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, you can only know so much um, on the chemical side because, like, like you get a certain point where, like, you enter in the proprietary zone and, like, they won't tell you things. So it's like you, you can have Alkid is, like, one of the, the resins for architectural paints, especially trim enamels. But, like, you start looking into it and there's, like, 20 ways you could make an Alkid. <laughs> yeah, you know, and like they're like they're messing around with it, and so like you have like these new like lower VOC paints, and so you're thinking like, well, what's the best thinner I can use that plays well with this? And then then it it starts to get confusing, um, and like they're not going to help you understand that because it's like that's their baby; they're not going to give you that. Um, so you, you can only, I've I found I can only do so much with that. Like I'm a an applicator i'm not a chemist um is so it i'll try is to it true it. or is, I'm, I'm trying hard not to to channel my inner mickey and but is it true that you have uh at least looked into adding your own chemicals to paint to get it to do what you want to do specifically defoamers i believe can you tell us about that uh <laughs> so i um <laughs> When I first got started, like in the business, um, I had like a super strong connection with Farron Ball, um, and uh, I had a vested interest in trying to um, make their products work. Um, so uh, um, sometimes you get. Sometimes you get like these micro bubbles that looks like micro bubbles and that could be air entrapment. Uh, but air entrapment can happen like a, there's reason, like there's multiple reasons for that. And uh, normally to get rid of air bubbles, they have to foamers. And um, so essentially it's like bubble poppers. Um, so if you have bubbles, there's something in there that breaks those bubbles. And uh, the idea is, like, that should happen fast enough before the film starts to, like, harden over um, so that you don't have bubbles stuck in the paint film. And so, like, that could be an application error. Like, maybe you have way too much air on the gun or uh, maybe your atomization is not sufficient. Um, but it can also be uh, paint chemistry, too. And... Uh, it gets tricky because you like as an applicator, like we want a perfect application and we want the paint to flow over a surface and, you know, wet a surface. So it's glass smooth, but to do that, you need surfactants, which is like soap, right? But, you know, we all know what happens with soap and water, you get bubbles. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I was like pulling my hair out, trying to figure out like, how do I make, uh, these bubbles go away and you can, yeah. I mean, they sell to foamers aftermarket to foamers and stuff like that. Um, if it's a German company and you do not have a commercial address, um, do not tell them you don't have a commercial address. Um, you know, <laughs> send it to your friend. Um, so you tried to buy these foamers from Germany and got shut down. Yeah, they're so strict about it. Like, um, yeah, it's like, can you send all, to the paint store? And they're all like, because you were trying to make a paint that if anyone in here knows is one of the more difficult paints. Uh, it's easy to talk crap about Farrow and Ball's quality of paint. Um, but Farrow well, Ball is not I, known for having an incredibly high quality, easy to apply line of paint. Am I wrong? No, if, I, I'm not here to badmouth them. Like I, I like I, I said, I apologize. Like, Let's walk it back. Yeah, but I, Tell I was looking for ways to make it better. Ball. What? Let's talk about Feral Ball paint because people use okay. it. Okay. Um, Feral Ball has beautiful colors, um, and uh, that is not marketing. Um, and. Uh, if you don't think that's the case, try and color match Hague blue. Yeah. Um, like your paint store is not going to get it. I don't think. Um, but uh, um, 
that comes down to the craftsman. Like sometimes that's what people want. So if that's what they want, then I'm going to figure out how to use it to give them the best results for what they want. And uh, may not, um, there might be cases where certain, certain brands have certain products that I want to use, but as a professional, if that's what they want, that's what we'll do. Um, so uh, the colors for Fair and Ball are legit. Um, and uh, I, I like their division. Like the fact that they only have um, a small color palette is actually kind of smart. I mean, it really makes color choice easier. Um, so I, I'm trying to think. They have, they have their two wall paints. They have their flat wall paint. Um, and I mean, that's easy. I mean, it's, it's super delicate. Um, and, uh, don't breathe on it. Don't kill a spider on it. You know, nothing like that. Um, <laughs> they have, and they're all British terms. So they call them emulsions. A wall paint is emulsion. Took me a while to like get that. Um, their, uh, their modern emulsion has got a little more sheen. That's more like an eggshell. Um, the dark colors and the modern, modern emulsion, um, those are really hard to apply, like without, without hat bad, without hat banding or edge banding, like that's tricky. Um, they have two trim paints and they, I guess they call trim paint eggshell, which is confusing as an American painter. Um, but it's a term. It's like an, you know, like, that's like saying enamel. So they have their uh, estate eggshell, which is like a 20 sheen. Um, and that is a waterborne alkyd. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty robust. I mean, and uh, then they have their modern eggshell, which has a little bit of polyurethane in it. It used to be their floor paint, and they, they rebranded it to being more universal. That's actually not a bad product. Um, I've... I've applied that, and that's outperformed cabinet coat. Um, like I, I've been kind of impressed with that. The, um, then they have their full gloss, and it, I mean that truly is a '95 sheen. Um, it really is. It's just, um, it's hard to work with. It's hard to apply. Um, it's it's difficult. <laughs> There's a uh, doesn't doesn't always dry quickly, kind of stays sticky sometimes. Um, I, I haven't found a single um, waterborne thinner that works for it. Um, and uh, like if you thin it with water, it, it just stays sticky. Um, doesn't dry well. Like it's, it, it's a tricky product. Is but, that the paint um, that you were trying to buy the emulsion, the um, defoamer for? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I tried everything. Like, I mean, I, I was pretty, pretty rigorous. Um, and, uh, um, what I would find is I could get a pretty good application. Um, but I have, if you look really close, like little sparkles, like in the paint and, uh, um, I wasn't like, I was trying to figure out how to get rid of that. So I was trying every, every spray method I could think of. Um, and, uh, every time I'd try something like a new application, like line of attack, it'd just be the same result. Um, so I bought like every kind of water, waterborne thinner on the market and, uh, and tried them. And, uh, there's something about the alkyd, like that just, it's like sticky. Um, it's hard to describe. And, uh, so I was looking for ways to, um, counteract that. And, uh, the, the only solution I could ultimately find, um, to like, to make me happy was, uh, to cut and buff it. And like that, that resolved the issue. Um, but the, the cutting and buffing is like a whole other process. So if you can avoid that, it's, it's nice to be able to do that. I would love to talk about that a little bit later if, if you want to go into it. And Nick asks, um, did you invent the thinner, Jack? No. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. We never found a thinner. Um, no. Nope. It's true that you charge significantly more to a, a client than even the 60 if they want to do a Pharaoh and Ball gloss, correct? 
Um, yep. I tell them uh, uh, that uh, it's going to cost more because it's mandatory to cut and buff to get the result they want. Um, and that's, that's more. Um, somebody asked, do I use their primer? Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I think anytime you're using um, an imported product, you got to be careful intermixing domestic products with it. It's like, I mean, you use domestic primers, that could be fine. It might be okay, but it could backfire. Um, that happens with fine paints of Europe pretty often. Um, yeah. But there's there's been a lot of cases where, like, um, I haven't run into it too much, but I know it can happen where even if even if the resin's the same, like, let's say you're putting acrylic over acrylic, um, like, they can still be incompatible, and, like, it can turn pink or things like that. And uh, they they do make coatings in Europe a little bit different, and so you probably could mix and match some, but I, I I would put it through its paces before I trusted it. And it's just not worth the risk, right? We're talking about primer. Use the primer yeah. that is recommended by the manufacturer, because then it's just one less thing you have to worry about. That's how I feel. I I know I didn't come into this well, fine paste thing thinking like and, that. And good luck getting them trying to uh, warranty anything, you know, when you're like, oh, yeah, we didn't use your primer. Like, uh, exactly. like they're going like, to they're, they're gonna stick it to you. It's a very small um, price to pay for an insurance policy of at least saying I did everything in my – because that's all we're doing, right? We talked about this on other episodes. Like, when we show up to on a project, all we're trying to do is, is do, do everything in our power, especially on a gloss job. We're trying to do everything in our power to give you the perfect project. Yeah. There's so many variables and it's such a high bar. We're not, nothing's gonna go perfect. But if it's one thing I can cross off the list of like, well, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. You know, we're always trying yeah. to find things to cross off the list and not have to worry about. Well, and like, hey, like if you don't wanna use their primer for like the dirt, you know, from start to finish, that's fine. Like you could like, let's say you love sticks, then do like five coats of sticks and then one coat of Fairball yes. primer. Like, yes, that's how I would handle it. Personally. Do that all the time. Um, Not sticks specifically, yeah. but you can use plenty. Any, you can use all sorts of primers, but yeah, we apply FPE top coat. It's over FPE primer every single time. And why? Yep. Do you Absolutely. On on same boat completely. Yeah. Cutting and buffing. Can you tell us a little bit or as much as you want to about cutting and buffing? So um, it's not for every project, but I, I would say a lot of times painters or finishers, like once you've done your final money coat, most of, most often, like you walk away and you say it's done, it's finished. Um, but it's possible to take it a step further. You can finish the finish. Yes, you can. And, uh, um, I mean, so yeah, you can do that. And uh, I, I think you do that most often for gloss. Um, and uh, it's you know a lot of times it's I present it as something that's optional. Um, especially if you get like the micro dust, then I have that as an option. And I say, Hey, like, if you don't like it, we can make it go away, but it's another process and there's a, there's a price associated with that so that I'm not stuck doing it for free. Um, so I, I just put it up front. So expectations are set. Um, so that's most often when I'm doing something like that, um, cutting and buffing. Um, so what is cutting and buffing for people who aren't familiar? Um, so in that world, um, I, you know, I learned most of what I learned from the automotive market. And, uh, I, I think that's a good way to learn stuff too, because they're like cutting edge. So, um, they're kind of light years. I mean, they're, they're ahead of the market in terms of innovation, I would say. Um, so, uh, 
I'm just going to throw a couple terms out and define them because I think that'll make it easier to talk about it. Um, when you say buff, typically you mean you are using some sort of polishing action. I mean, you could do it by hand. Um, that would take for forever. Um, so it's typically done with like a buffing machine. Um, so usually buffing refers to restoring the sheen to a surface. So if, if you have something that was gloss and you did something to take the, the sheen away, typically buffing means you're restoring the sheen. Um, cutting usually refers to a sanding operation of some sort. Um, the term color sanding, so if you're like, if you're going to color sand, that typically means um, you are going to sand a finished surface dead flat. So no matter how well you apply your product, like there will be an anchor pattern or some texture or some structure uh, in the coating. Um, and that could just be how the coating dries. Like it could wet the surface perfect, but it still might have like a, you know, a slight amount of orange peel or a slight amount of waviness or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so if you're going to cut, if you're going to color sand, you would actually sand that waviness out completely. So it's dead flat without sanding through your, your top coat. Once you've done that, typically you've, you've gone from a gloss to a flat and then you're going to go through a process of buffing to restore the sheen to a higher gloss. And typically, if you've done that right, you have the best results. Like you have the best reflection. You have the smoothest surface to the touch. You have the best reflection. It's uh, you're you're making it perfect, the best that you can, and. You don't get those results unless you finish the finish. I, I'm, I'm smiling because this is like the we're, we're deep into this now. And this is like the gold that anyone who's like yeah. stuck around to listen. If you guys probably you may or may not know this, but Jack is one of is, is arguably the best buffer of architectural coatings um, in North America. And uh, I know that you have spent a massive amount of time perfecting the craft of cutting and buffing architectural coatings. Um, if someone wanted to try to get into it, because we're not going to ask you to give away all of your secrets because you've spent a ton of time doing it, but if someone was going to try to get into doing this, where would they start? Um, well, you're going to need the tools. So you're going to, you're going to need a machine to buff with. So, you will need either a rotary buffer or you will need a dual action polisher. Um, and if, if you're looking to get into it, you just need to write those two terms down and then you can go find something. Um, because it would, I mean, there are so many different manufacturers. So to, you know, like, like there's different types of each of those. Like it gets really complicated really fast, but you're going to need one of the two. Um, you, you need something for that. You're, you're going to need uh, um, compounds and polishes, uh, which are essentially liquid abrasives. Uh, the idea is once you get to a, a high enough grit of sandpaper, it's hard to have a dry, dry sandpaper because it's going to build up too much friction and it's not going to cut. It's just going to build up heat and it's going to gum up and your sandpaper is going to cornice. Um, that sometimes is a sign that your coating hasn't cured, but it's also a sign that you have too much friction build up. And at a certain point you're going to have to induce like a liquid to help lubricate and keep the heat down. Um, so you got, there's different systems out there um, and you just have to pick one and start with it. There's a Festool system. That's what I started with. Um, you don't have to use a Festool buffer. <laughs> so all of you who wants to try it, like phew, don't have to buy, the Festool. buy a Festool buffer. <laughs> but there, um, there's systems kind of intuitive. Like that's a pretty easy one. 
Um, but there's uh, 3M has a system. Uh, there's McGuire's that you get probably from any uh, Idaho. Um, or, or, sorry, if you guys like reading the comments. Um, from any AutoZone or uh, like O'Reilly's or something like that. Um, so you have to just go find a system. And typically they'll have pads that correspond to different steps. Um, and uh, if you're going to do it, get something that's flat um, and uh, go through the process of applying the best that you can and then let, let your coating cure. Um, and a good sign that it's cured is you can't smell it anymore. So I, I know it seems weird, but like if this is like your piece of drywall, like put your nose up to it and see if you can smell it. If you can't smell it, it's probably good. It's probably ready to go. It's probably cured. And then you can go through the process. Um, and uh, it's not, it's not the, it's not rocket science, but it's not the easiest thing in the world. And uh, every coating um, behaves a little bit differently. Like I, I don't do the same thing I do with fine paints that I do with Theron Ball or vice versa or so on and so forth. Like in, you just have to get there and practice it. Um, and uh, I think Phil's saying he's used 3M on hand rub varnish furniture. So you, you can rub out to lower sheens too um, that's significantly harder um, because you have to try and keep the sheen consistent. So it's if, you, if you're going to polish, going up to a gloss is the easiest. Um, <laughs> and then, like, the lower you go, the harder it is. And um, I, I wouldn't say I've mastered the lower sheens. Um, I, they used to do it all the time back in the day, but... Um, it, that's almost like paint knowledge that's been forgotten. Yep. You know, um, it's not that no one doesn't, it's not that it's never been done. It's that uh, I guess the industry, you know, kind of changed with sprayers and stuff like that. You know, we got more like technology that I think we lost some of the, some and, of that and stuff. And I think budgets affect a lot of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. The cost of labor is probably increased. Uh, significantly. I actually have a price out <laughs> like, right now. I, it's like a $547,000 bid that we did three tiers of. And one of them is like yeah. 360000 And if we do a hand rubbed finish, it's going to be at 547000 because the amount of yeah. labor that's going to go into hand rubbing all of the trim and polishing all of the trim is, you know, it's insane. Cause we just said you get to the point where. <laughs> The paint looks pretty good. And now you're going to start going into what we're talking about is probably the hardest part of, of any of the things we've been talking about tonight. Yeah. Um, and like we always say, I, I, go ahead. I, I would say this, like um, buffing is not a fix for crappy prep work. No. Um, like it is. Um, so don't like I've had people ask me that like this, this gloss job's terrible. Can you come buff it? Like, no one can. It um, It doesn't work that way. Like, it's it is a process that is made possible when all the other steps have been done correctly. And when all the other steps have done been done correctly, then you have the option to do, like, a final step. But, like, it, it won't fix um, – it won't fix lesser work or inferior work. Like it doesn't work that way. Or the bug that landed in my satin door that I wanted to be able to polish off, but it's not going to happen. It has to get resprayed. Yeah, yeah, that's that's that's. I had that this morning. I had three doors and I had like the little gnats. And, We're running uh, a uh, a bug zapper. I bought a bug zapper on Amazon. Some people have probably seen it in my stories. We, uh, I have one, but it's not like the bug zapper is not going to like cover the entire interior of the house. I mean, yeah, I know it's brutal. Yeah. Those little bugs. Okay. Bug that's, that's, that's awesome. So it's just like what 
was taught with me when I first started this fine paints thing is like you're spraying every coat like it's finished coat. You're every step of the way is best practice, best practice. You're not like someone that reached out to me this week and was like, you know, I, I'm I'm going to be doing a gloss door, but I'm going to brush all of the coats up until the final coat. And I was like, I highly recommend you don't do that. Um, you should the opposite. <laughs> yeah. Yes. You can spray yeah. all the way up and then brush the final coat if that's what you're going for. But if you're looking yeah. for a sprayed finish, don't think that you can brush all your coats up until finish. Um, anyone that's done that or tried to do, do that will tell you how much work that you've created for yourself. Um, yeah. Treat every yeah. coat like it's your it's the final coat. When you're doing this gloss up, especially, right? We treat every every coat of primer like it's finished coat. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if you if you want to do any kind of buffing, cutting, anything like that, like you don't you don't skip any steps. Like everything has to be on point. Your prep work, all the way to your finish work. If you're gonna if you're gonna try and tackle that, otherwise, don't. Yeah, and like don't don't try it on like a soft coating. Like if you if you got like wall paint, you know, like it's not. <laughs> It's not going to work. It Don't needs to dry hard. Don't paint, people. Yeah. Yep. Not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's that's awesome. So every coat, treat every coat like it's your last coat, um, which is, I think that that is kind of different than standard domestic painting. Um, domestic painting, as I was taught, is like, just like, you know, go, 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 go. And then like before the last coat, we'll like make everything nice and then we'll put our final coat on. Um, that's definitely yeah. more of a domestic painting style. And when the European paint started being brought into my world, it was like, all right, we're going to treat every coat like it's our last. Um, and if you want the results that were, that are possible, that's the way to do it. Um, so the same, well, it's like with buffing. If you do every step correctly, the next step should be faster than before. Like your second coat of primer should go faster than your first coat of primer. Right. Even, yeah. even when you're trying to do it like perfect and it's because you tried to do it perfect every single time. Um, but yeah. And, and even then I, I, cause until you try to cut and buff, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah then we'll just cut and buff it. And then once you've no, tried, no, it's not just like, yeah, 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 we'll cut it. It's like a lot of work. Um, it takes, a uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's not fast. No. No. I mean, some people think like just running the buffer over the surface without any kind of abrasion, they call that polishing. Like it's not. I mean, you might affect the sheen a little bit, but you're not improving. You're not actually finishing the finish. Yeah. Um, so like, I mean, there's a pretty big difference right there. Um, so yeah, it, and it, it takes a while. It, it takes me a long time if, if you want to do it right. Yeah. I think, All right. I think, so, uh, I did a, yeah. yeah. What, no, keep going. Yeah. So I, I think that we, we're going to wrap it up at three hours, guys. So we're not going an extra hour. So I hate to break it to everybody. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to get up and just get something to eat. Um, so we have some standard questions, but I, I, I'd like to, to talk about some of your projects that you've worked on. Um, okay. What's your favorite, like give us some of your favorite projects and what you liked about them. And, and if we can see them on Instagram. Um, I think like the, the gloss project I'm probably most proud of is a powder room that I did that's gray. Um, and uh, I cut and buffed everything. Um, and uh, I, I've had other projects that I cut and buffed, but like that one was probably like like the coolest. Um, so I that's probably like my my most prestigious project, I guess. Um, uh, you can see that on your, your Instagram feed, correct? Yep. Yep. It's a great powder room. 
Um, I mean, it's a big powder room. So some people might not think of it as a powder room. It's like 12 foot ceilings. Um, but a powder room for everybody is, is a bathroom that doesn't have a shower in it, correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. But big houses it, have them. It's a big house. Yep. They have fancy yeah. rooms too. What did it cost to paint yeah. that room? That that small little tiny bathroom that didn't have a shower. Uh, over thirteen thousand to paint a, a bathroom. Um, yeah. Is it true that you had to? Is this the project that you had to move a, a ten thousand dollar plus toilet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I almost didn't get the job because no one wanted to move the toilet and. Uh, <laughs> Normally, like, I don't want to move. Like, I'm not a plumber. I don't want to do that. And then I realized um, I may not get the job because no one's going to move the toilet. And it's like, I'll figure it out. And uh, it turned out to be, you know, pretty pretty easy to do it. But uh, it was like this Inspector Gadget toilet. Um, it was all electronic, heated seats. I mean, uh, it That's, was impressive. Jack, you're on another level that you actually removed – a. Uh, over ten thousand dollar toilet, and then put a third. I was gonna lose the job. Look, I wasn't gonna get the job because <laughs> um, they were worried about the toilet, and uh, it turned out like the Inspector Gadget toilet was um, surprisingly easy. Um, it was like just two screws and uh, um, like one pipe, and you just had to like turn a valve off. And it, it took me like way too long to figure that out. But once I figured it out, it's like, oh, this is easy. But picking up yeah. a, what it's, it, I remember you told me the price at one point, but some absurd amount of money to pick up. It was like the it was like, like, like eleven thousand or something like $11, that. Eleven thousand dollar toilet. Yeah, that that's yeah. a that's got to be a fun experience. Um, all right, so that project's awesome. You have you have an amazing portfolio of projects. Do you have any others you want to tell us about? I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm most known for, like, the green room um, that I did for Wendy Labrum. Uh, and that's actual Fairholme Ball. Um, so no, no gimmicks, no clear coat, no nothing. Like, it's Fairholme Ball. Um, Wait, people put clear so. coats over the top of paint and no, then no no one ever does that yeah no, no one, one does, does that, that. yeah no. nobody ever puts clear coats over paint and buffs it um <laughs> yeah that what tell us about that project um that was uh i i don't know like for some reason like that that one is like super popular like it makes like the magazines and like it like pops up on Instagram every once in a while. People are like, I love this green room. Um, that's, uh, that's actually when I first got into buffing. Um, you know, I got called in to help the designer to do the, um, to do it in Pharaoh and Ball because Pharaoh and Ball controlled the show house. So you switch the product, you get kicked out of the show house. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, they're paying to run it. So yeah, I mean, of course they make the rules. And, uh, yeah. So I did it, and uh, it just wasn't quite there. And uh, I was like, okay, i got to make this better. And uh, at least, like I thought that, and uh, the designer came in, and she looked at it, and she goes, because at first she's like, I don't, I'm not going to buff it. Like, I don't want to pay for that. And uh, she looked at it, and, and she just like kind of, she's, <laughs> I think her, like, she said, what the hell, buff it. And I was like, okay, like it needs to cure, right? And uh, she's like, yeah, but um, we can only wait four days. And then uh, we have to put the furniture in here because then it's going to start. So we can't wait for it to cure. So I remember looking at her, I was like, well, it, it may not last. And she's like, it just has to like last through the show house. And I was like, I mean, it's your room. I mean, so I was like, okay, I guess I have to buff this, and uh, I do. I do not recommend this. Um, so for, for anybody so out for there, everybody, the reason that you wouldn't want to buff that coating is it wasn't done moving. 
So you were going to make it perfectly flat, and it was going to keep curing and, like, lose it flat. Oh, yeah. So if it's not hard enough, um, if your coating isn't hard enough, really fine sanding marks won't take. It's like you literally can't refine the surface. Um, and then uh, coatings shrink as they cure. Um, and uh, when they shrink, um, uh, what happens is it can pull those sanding marks back out. So even though you work the sanding marks out, they can reappear kind of like, you know, like a tattoo gets stretched out and you get old and fat and it looks terrible. It's like, it's the same thing. Like you make it look really, really good. And then all of a sudden all this stuff comes out. Um, so you don't like, it's not a production thing. Um, like you, it could, after it cures at the end of 30 days or something, you could have issues or if it's not hard enough, um, you can heat it up too much and the, the substrate texture might come back out um, because you got too much heat going and, and it hadn't cured enough. Like you have a multitude of problems that can happen just because you're impatient. Um, so here I am with a show house and it's like, it's kind of high profile because it's like, you know, I did this for way cheaper than it should have been to be in the show house. And uh, you know, I have like these fair and ball connections. So like my reputation's on the line, like I got to hold the line for the brand. And um, so I remember like, it's like talking to my wife is like, well, she didn't sign up for originally, but now she wants to buff it. I can only let it sit for four days. Um, and I uh, went out and I got like the Festool polisher. And uh, I will tell anybody now, like, um, you don't need the Festival Polisher. <laughs> like you, you could buy like three others for the same price. Um, and uh, I just remember my wife, she's like, have you done that before? It's like, I've read about it. And uh, I think I burned through in like one spot. Um, and uh, I kind of, like I somehow pulled it off. And uh, so I, I buffed all the flats, but anything that had like a curve, like any kind of like molding or profile I left alone. Um, Cause I only had so much time um, and uh, I, like I couldn't spend a week. I think I had three days um, to get in there and cut and buff the majority of the room. And uh, I mean, it ended up looking pretty good, um, but don't like, I mean, not ideal. And that, that's kind of how I got my teeth. It's kind of how I cut my teeth is like, all right, um, but it would have been much better to practice at home. I, I would oh, not yes. recommend learning on the fly like that. Um, but it, it's some like I, I, I pulled it off even though I probably shouldn't have been able to. And, uh, you know, that's one, that's a higher profile project. Um, I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, how about a, now we're going to get into our standard ZK Live questions to wrap this up. Okay. Um, we need, we've just talked about like the highest level of painting there is. Can you give us a DIY painting tip for people out there who are not professional painters? Um, I, I think my biggest tip would be I'm trying to think like I had to come up with like a good tip that no one else has said already. Like, you know, like Nick's like use tape. It's like, come on, Nick. That was my tip. Um, <laughs> Mine was don't paint out uh, of the gallon. Yeah. Um, biggest DIY tip. Um, I would you say figures for when you're on the show, he's given his already. Yeah, Nick, yeah, Nick's saying use a light. That's your tip, Nick. Come on. Um, <laughs> I would say take take the time to uh, to make sure you can do everything right. So, like, if you need to like move the furniture and stuff like that, do it. Um, protect things like use drops. Um, if you don't have drops, use newspapers. Um, and uh, you know, protect things. That I mean that. 
I know that sounds kind of simple, but uh, things like life goes so much easier if you just slow things down a little bit. Sometimes you like slow it down to speed it up. And, yeah, and that sounds weird. Don't but. just don't try to start painting the, the second you start working on the project. Get, have a so. little bit of setup time before you start to paint. That's a great tip. Um, or that can, so yeah, we can tell that to a lot of professional painters out there too. Maybe don't yeah. show up and start painting instantly. Yeah. Um, or may, maybe maybe uh, for cutting straight lines, maybe we'll give tips for that. Yeah, because right? that's that's something people will probably do. So I would say um, if you're cutting a straight line, sorry, I have to kind of back up a little bit. Um, you cut from your shoulder. Like uh, a lot of times, you know, people want to move their hand to like to cut a line. But like if you're trying to cut a line on a wall, you don't move your elbow, you don't move your wrist. It's almost entirely in your shoulder. Um, that would be my biggest tip. Um, All right. We're going to have now, like you're just scratching the surface of so much more stuff. We're going to have to have you back for another episode because – there are so many things, like you just said that so casually, but there are so many like fundamental core principles that I think that you could share. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you. You just made it. You're solidified 100% you're coming back. I don't care. We could talk for another okay. hours no. easy. I mean, God, we probably talked, uh, we've talked many, many hundreds of hours at this point. Um, yeah. So we did DIY. Uh, now we need um, your favorite piece of paint paraphernalia. It could be a tool, a type of paint, uh, estimating software, it, you name it. It has to do something with paint at, at, in some way, shape, or form. What's your favorite? Okay, so probably my favorite trim paint of all time is Hall & Lack Eggshell. Um, and uh, I like, my favorite is a brushed finish. The reason I like it is you are able to brush and have your surface dry down perfectly smooth with no ropey brush marks. However, the flatteners will dry in the direction that you tip off with the brush so that once you get to about two feet or closer, you can actually see those hand brushed. Um, to me, I think that's like, that's the coolest paint look. Um, so I would take that over a spray job every day. Um, That's amazing. So paint-wise, I'd say that. Um, and then uh, for brushes, probably my favorite brush. Um, there's a lot of them out there. Um, I like... Uh, there's a, it's an art brush called the red line you can get from the paint store. And uh, they got like these ridiculously red, long red handles. Uh, and they have a kind of a, a blend of nylon polyester, but they're very, like the brushes are thinner. Like you have thin ferrules. It's not a production brush, but for fine finishing work, um, like I've had pretty good results with that. Um, and uh, it's not for every project, but I kind of like the brushes. Like they're, it's just a little different. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we got favorite paint, piece of paint paraphernalia. Um, now we have to go to, see, I usually use my, I'm doing this on an iPad. I usually have my okay. iPad with my notes and my phone up in the thing. So I don't get to go to my notes. Um, I feel like we're missing a third one before embarrassing moment. Oh, well, we can go straight to embarrassing moment and you can think of a different one. All right. Um, I mean, I, I definitely had a, I remember one of my more dumb moments was uh, I was spraying the exterior of a house and um, like almost all painters do, you're setting up the sprayer and you have either like a, a piece of plastic or paper that you test your fan pattern on, right? And um, so 
we had, there is like a back porch that was screened. So we had like the screen mast and I, you know, I didn't think anything of it. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to test my fan pattern. Well, um, it was at that moment that uh, the paint went through the plastic and uh, it hit the screen and the screen acted like this diffuser. And like, instead of having a straight stream of paint, like go into like this back enclosed porch, like it hit the screen and the screen just diffused the paint everywhere. <laughs> like, the, like the entire room was covered in like, like this fine like paint. And like, it was like on their patio furniture and everything. And, um, oh, okay. Somebody said, spill the paint on the carpet, move the chair over and walked away. That's not what you do. If you spill paint on the carpet, you throw their dog in the paint and blame it on the dog. That's great, too. <laughs> not, but not really. But, um, no, but, but not really. Um, so, uh, I, uh, um, yeah, it, it, was, it, it was precisely at that moment where it's like I'm outside and um, like I'm spraying and you're like, why do I test fan patterns when I have like what a minimum of 1500 PSI? Like, why am I using paper and plastic, which is like what <laughs> a couple of mils thick to test like my fan pattern and like everybody does it. But then you do it and you're like, then you realize like, I'm such an idiot. Like, of course I can't like spray something at 1500 PSI. Um, that, that was kind of a, a bonehead move. For sure. Man, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I, the, yeah, the, the, P, the one I was forgetting that we've been asking now is a piece of business, business advice um, for okay. contractors or anyone really. But what, what's something that you've learned that you wish you knew earlier? That I, that I wish I knew earlier? Yeah. Um, uh, I think the hardest, like, some, some of what I've learned kind of going into it is, like, I probably wish I was, like, a better negotiator up front. Like, I, th I think in the beginning, um, in a lot of ways – my sense of customer service really just meant kind of rolling over and being like, okay, I'll do it for that price. Or, and uh, the, the longer I've done it, the more I've realized a lot of times if I'm just firm, it, it's not poor customer service. It's just, it's uh, it's not devaluing yourself, so to speak. Um, and uh, I think if I were to go back, like that would probably be the biggest thing. Um, don't, don't, don't drop your prices. Um, I, I think you're like, you're tempted to almost like you're chasing a carrot, but it doesn't stop there. Like, I mean, what I found is you, you cut somebody some slack, but then they just keep going. Like they don't stop till you, till you be firm at a certain point. Um, and uh, normally I just want to do the best job I can. Um, I want them to be happy. Um, like I, I try to keep their best interests at heart. Um, but you can get yourself in trouble. Um, and you cause yourself headaches. Like you can make a perfectly, you can set up a perfectly good customer to be a bad customer because they realize they can get up whatever they want from you. Um, and it's, yeah, it's okay to stick up and be a little firmer. I, in my case, that'd probably be the best. That would have helped me the most, advice-wise. That's a great piece of advice. I think it's what we were talking about earlier, like being comfortable in that silence. You know, the negotiation they talk about. You know, whoever speaks first loses. Um, yep. There, yep. there's something so true of just say whatever it is, and then just don't, don't talk, and magically. Yeah. You, the first time it happens, you're like, oh, oh, really? It, yeah, it worked. Yeah, it was right on the other side of the awkward silence. I got a yes, um, but you start to backtrack and uh, uh, and once they see that, you're like a wounded animal, and that people just attack. 
especially if you have like a hardcore negotiator or something like uh, they, they just keep going for it. But um, you know, th those are things like I, I would say I'm probably like a better technician in like on the business side. That's probably where a lot of my personal weaknesses are. So, you know, like it's, it's learning those kind of business things where like that's helped me the most um, uh, like in my case. Um, I'm, I'm sure if I uh, studied under Chris from Shoreline for a while, probably never make those mistakes again. But uh, yeah. um, you know, he's he's got a real talent and knack for all this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Hey man, we're three hours deep, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface. But we have to end it. Um, yep. Thanks for coming on, man. I I really appreciate it. Dropping yeah. all that knowledge. It's always my pleasure. To yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Cool. All right. All right. See you. Bye. Everybody. All right. All right. Everybody, I highly recommend following Jack Andrews. Send him DMs. Tell him, please post more. Um, he's a busy man. Don't ask him too many questions. Um, but what a great guy. Super knowledgeable. If you could take anything away, you know, it's study this stuff. Think about this stuff. Test stuff. Like, if you're a painter, love being a painter and think about this stuff. And, and there are people, now that you've seen, you've, there are people out there who are thinking about this stuff all the time and are trying stuff. They're doing the R&D. I, when I, growing up, I didn't know people doing R&D in painting. My bosses weren't doing R&D. They just, whatever the Sherman Williams paint rep told them to do, they did it and they moved on. And I, I think by doing the R&D, you can really get better. You can push it and you can feed the craftsman, craftsperson inside of you. Um, so I, I definitely really believe in that idea of, and it, it was something that was hard for me at first to get my head around, like go into the shop, buy a bunch of supplies, spend hours for no one's paying you to do it. Uh, but the more you can work that muscle, um, that's how you, in my experience, can elevate the level of your craft. Um, so again, thanks for joining us. There's two minutes left on a three hour session. My contacts have been dry forever. I have all sorts of weird blinking I've been doing. Um, but it's Saturday night. I appreciate you guys watching. Uh, stay tuned next week. We have, um, oh my God, I'm gonna forget his first name. HDI Stair, uh, Hardwood Designs. They're a crazy high-end custom stair designer um we're gonna have him on i believe his name is bill uh and we're gonna talk about how he built his company they they do the all the premier um crazy staircases around new england um and he's been in business for a long time so we're gonna get to pick his brain and hear how he got to uh where he is and we can hopefully we can all learn from that so stay tuned guys